God is good. Come on now. I set y'all up for that and you missed it. God is good. How often is good God good? All the time. God is good. Amen. Praise his name. Well, this morning, the title of my message is The God of Peace. If, I'm going to wait for Cody to catch up with me for just a minute. I kind of caught him off guard there this morning. And I take my message from part of the verse of uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. This verse, if you go in your Bible and find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is in a place where Paul is instructing the church because they had become, in, in our modern day way of saying it, especially in Assembly of God Church, they had kind of gotten carried away in their Pentecostalism. They had gotten carried away in the gifts of the Spirit and they were, they were just going above and beyond. There was, there was confusion in the, in the church. And Paul wanted them to know as he brings this instruction, and that's not what I'm preaching about today, very different from that but I wanted you to know where this verse comes from that that even within the body of Christ we can have times when we get loud where we shout we run we dance but it needs to be done in an orderly fashion but God spoke the truth of this verse very deeply into my heart just the other day that it applies not just to what goes on in the church service, but it applies to every area of our lives. Our God is not one who desires or who will. God will not bring confusion into our lives. I want you to stop and think on that for a moment. Not only will he not do it in church, confusion is not God's desire in the church. God's desire is that we not live in a place of confusion. Our God is not a God of confusion. That word confusion, if you've heard me preach many times, I like to look up the word in their original language and see how they're, how they're translated. If you know much about language, there are some things that just don't translate. There are words that you go from one language to another and there just isn't a matching exact word. And, and I'm not saying that's the situation here, but when I study scripture, that's one of the places I begin is looking at the important words in a verse to see how they're being translated. Is there a better way for me to understand? So I looked up this word confusion it literally means instability. It is a state of disorder, of disturbance, of confusion, a state of tumult. It's a word we don't use very often, tumult. But I think every one of us know what the word means. That's one of those words that it sounds like what it means, tumult. It just sounds, and it is. That's the idea. This past Friday morning, I experienced just what the scripture was talking about in confusion of all places at a funeral service. Throughout the entire service, and this is not, I'm not saying what I'm about to say as a, as a, uh, a slam on anybody or anything. It's just the way it was. Throughout the entire service, there were children talking and moving about, even at the front of the service, right in front of the pastor, coming and going. There were adults that were coming and going throughout the entire funeral service, as well as what you normally see, the tears and the sorrow the heartache because of a life that had been taken in tragedy, in severe tragedy. But as I sat through that hectic service, and that, I was sitting toward the back, and from my vantage point, that's what it was. It was I was seeing everything. I was seeing every movement almost. And it, it does, you, you know what it's like to be in a service, and people coming and going, gets distracted. But as I sat there through that service, I saw that most of those who were in attendance that day, that I was witnessing what was in reality normality for their lives. 
the, the confusion, the chaos, uh, it was just part of the normality of their lives. Their lives were filled with this every day. Disorder, instability, tumult was their norm. Their lives uh, were just filled. You could just tell by, by their actions, their attitudes. And God began to speak to me this passage of Scripture. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our God is a God of, of peace. Now that, that word peace, the Greek word comes from a verb. Now peace is not a verb, it's a noun. It's a thing, an object, however you want to say it, it is a noun. But the, ver the word comes from a verb which means to join together. Now think about that. To join together, you can only do that when there's peace. When one's all going and crazy, it's hard to join together. So that's where the noun comes from the verb. Usually it's the other way around. But this noun peace comes from the, from the verb where two come as one. And it really is, it's peace, it's quietness, it's rest all wrapped up in this word. And as I thought about that, I realized that God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. How, how utterly opposite those two words are. Confusion and peace. Disorder, disturbance, confusion, quietness, rest, and peace. God is referred to throughout the New Testament, not just in this verse, but throughout the, the New Testament, many places, many verses that say that God is the God of peace. And though Satan is not called, not given the title of, as the God of confusion or the God of disorder or the God of disturbance, he is clearly the source of these things. James chapter 3, listen to these verses and you'll see what I'm talking about. James chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, in other words, if it's all about you, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom, this selfish, self-centered thing, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, from God, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder. You see that? There is disorder and every evil thing, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. Obviously, very clearly we see there is an association, a cause and effect between Satan and confusion, disorder, tumult within a person's life. He is the source of these things. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan comes to do what? To steal, kill, and destroy. You know, one of the best ways uh, for one army to win over uh, a battle in their favor over another army, even an army of superior force and numbers, one army can win over the other if they can bring disorder and confusion into their enemy camp. Whether it's mess up their communication lines or go in and, and, and whatever it is. I don't know. I'm not in the military. I don't know all the plans and things they do. But that is one of the ways to defeat the enemy is to bring confusion. And that's what Satan wants to do in our lives. He wants to bring confusion, discontentment, disorder, unrest into our lives. And by that, he can begin to bring destruction. He can steal our victory. He can steal our joy. He can even bring about death, whether physically, mentally, death, you know, confusion. Spiritually, he can bring about death, separate us from God in our disorder. If God is the God of peace, and he most definitely is, then I believe Satan is death indeed and most definitely the God of confusion and disorder and tumult. 
So here's what I want to ask you this morning. How do we stand against his attacks of disorder? How do we defeat the enemy's uh, confusion that he tries to bring in our lives? Five words that I want to share with you, five thoughts. I'm going to try to move through this fast. But number one, we have to stay close to God in relationship. There must be love for God, for the Father in our lives. Deep love. A love that, that requires a loving relationship relationship requires number one commitment you know our love relationship with God cannot be a part-time relationship it must be full-time always we're loving God you know the Bible compares our relationship with God our born-again relationship to marriage we are the bride of Christ we're called you know a marriage is never a part-time commitment and if it is, it won't last. Huh? It won't last if it's part time. Our marriage vows speak of commitment. When we said, for better or for worse. In sickness or in health. Till death do us part. It's a matter of commitment. Jesus calls us to a serious commitment in our relationship with God. We need to live in that loving relationship close to him always. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew. Matthew chapter 16 concerning commitment. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it or will give it up. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you're pursuing you above God, you're going to come out a loser. But if you'll pursue God above yourself, you will come out a winner. That's what the Bible is saying. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What will a man be profited if he gains the whole world? How many times have you heard it said, there's never a U-Haul on the back of a hearse? If you gain everything, but you lose your soul, your relationship with God, what have you profited? So number one, prayer, a, 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 a rela loving relationship with God requires commitment. But secondly, you're not going to like this one. Are you mad at me already? Just get mad at me already. Go ahead. Just get warmed up. A loving relationship with God requires time. Because com commitment is often spelled T-I-M-E. Time. We cannot claim to love God if we never spend time with God. Well, say, you say, how do I spend time with God? See, I think you, you know these things, but I want to touch base with them again. Number one, through prayer. And prayer is not just telling God what you want, asking God for your needs. It's also listening to God talk to you. Prayer is a conversation. Prayer is a two-way street. Too many times we spend time telling God, asking God when what we need to do. And, and those are good. God tells us, cast our cares upon him. But then and sit still for a moment and shut up. Did I say that out loud? I'm not supposed to use that word, am I? And listen. Well, I've never heard the voice of God. If you'll get quiet enough, it's not going to be here that you'll hear the voice of God. It's here that you'll hear the heart, the voice of God. God will speak to you. We cannot claim to love God if we never spend time with Him. Not only in prayer, but in worship. Expressing our love and our commitment to God with our words. Let me say it again. With our words. Let me try one more time. We need to express our love to God with our words. And our emotions you know some of our spouses guys ladies as well but some of our spouses would abandon us if we expressed our love to them with such absence of emotion the way that we often express our love toward God God gave us emotion for a reason 
And every guy in here, and I, I don't know if you, all your personal lives real well, but if you tell me, well, I'm just not an emotional person, let me make you mad and let's see if you're an emotional person. <laughs> We guys are the world's worst at saying we're not emotional until somebody gets mad and we're and throwing and beating it. Oh, come on. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many men in this room at some time in your life have hit a wall or something with your fist? I got mine up. Okay, I'll put mine up more than once. Well, some of you guys did good. I, I you know, I, I found out that it, you always hurt me more than it did the wall. We need to be willing to express to God our words with deep, sincere emotion. Amen. Worship. Prayer. Worship. And the third one is one you probably might not think about. Ways to spend time with God. Time in prayer, time in worship, but time fellowshipping with believers. What does the Bible say happens when two or three are gathered in his name? He's there. You want to find God, go get with believers. There you'll be in our midst. Besides that, let me ask you this. If I love on your kids, don't you think I'm loving on you just a little bit? Yeah. If I said I didn't want to be around your silly wife, she bothers me. <laughs> You'd probably say to me, well, good, guys, you'd probably say to me, well, I don't need to spend time with you either. Then. If you won't be with my wife, you don't need to be around me. We are the children of God. We dote on God's kids. God's going to dote on us. And if we can't love God's wife, we are the bride of Christ. If we can't stand to be around his bride, just saying. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in worship. We need to spend time in fellowshipping with the believers. Amen. Third thing. This is the longest of my points. Ways that we love God. How do we fulfill our loving re re relationship with God? It must be a, a relationship of sincerity. Sincere love demonstrates its sincerity with actions, with evidence. For you to sit in your chair stone cold and say, yeah, I love God, it's, it's cheap. Words are cheap. Show me with your actions. Let the sincerity flow out of your heart. Heart. Love that is sincere is not convenient or occasional. Huh? When you really love somebody, sometimes you love them when you don't feel like loving them. Come on. All of us, you know, that are married in here, we can relate to that. Amen. The reality is sincere love is often very costly. Let us be willing to pay that price. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross. Let's be willing to pay the price to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, our strength. That's what Jesus said. The greatest commandment, love God. You want to avoid the attacks, to gain victory over the attacks of the enemy? Stay close to the Father. Stay closer. What is Psalm chapter 90 it is? Blessed is he who dwells under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm not quoting that exactly right in my mind. So I, that's it, Psalm 91. Thank you, Psalm 91. Blessed, who dwells in the shadow, in the shadow, in the shelter, in the shadow. The two words are used there together, of the Almighty. That's our place of safety. Number one, we need to love the Father. Secondly, we need to know the Word. We need to know God's word. God is revealed to us through his word. If you don't know the word very well, can I tell you, you probably don't know God very well. Because this is the revelation. This is where God says, let me show you who I am. With stories, with commandments to describe what he thinks is right, what he demands is right, and what he demands is wrong. This is where he tells us who he is and what he is all about. We may have experienced 
experiences with God, and that's a great thing. But our experiences cannot or sometimes are not truthful to the word of God. The Bible says that Satan comes as an angel of light. Satan will deceive us with experiences. If our experiences don't line up with the word of God, then our experiences are false. Yes, our experiences can be false. Jesus said, your word is truth. He was praying in John chapter 17. He said, thy word is truth. This is what we need to look to. If we want to defeat the enemy, we defeat him with truth, and this is the truth that we need. Preaching, teaching, those are good things, but we must also be committed to personal study in our lives, a regular reading of the Word of God. Now, I'm not going to put a, 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 a chain upon you to say, you need to read the Word of God every day, and if you don't, you're a sinner. I'm not going to tell you that. You need to read it regularly, though. You need to be in the Word. You need to know this word. And there are so many things that we have available to us today to help us in studying the word. Number one, there are a myriad of translations. You say, yeah, but I love that good old King James Version. Bless you if you do. But I'll bet you don't talk in King James language every day. Oh, except on Sundays. Nothing wrong with King James. I'm not knocking it at all. If that's what you grew up with and that's what you're comfortable with, that's great. But there are so many other things because many times there are words in the King James Version that we don't use anymore and we read them and we don't really know what it means. There are words in the King James Version that meant one thing in that day, the 1400s, that they mean completely different words today. They mean they have a different meaning. By so I'm just saying, there are other things that you can use to study so you understand. There are concordances, and if you don't know what it is or how to use a concordance, you come see me, but it helps you to understand the words of the Bible again. Vine's Dictionary, uh, uh, the full name is Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament words. That's a long title. I just call it Vines. But it's a great place to get some understanding. There are Bible programs that you can put on your computer for cheap and are easy to use that, that will help you. The Assemblies of God has the Berean School of the Bible. I did not get a Bible degree in college. I got an engineering degree in college. But when I got ready to go into the ministry, I felt God's calling the ministry. I found out that I couldn't be licensed or ordained in the Assemblies of God without some education. So I had to go through these courses. I could have taken them at a college level and gotten college credits, and it would have cost me a bunch more money. I was cheap. I was a, We were young, married. We didn't have much money. And so I took them at a, a certificate level, you could do the same thing, cost you 10 or $20, you get a textbook, you get a, a study guide, and you go through there, and you might do the Gospels, you might do the epistles of, 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 of Paul, or, or the epistles of John, different things, but you can study and, and get teaching and training, where you really begin to understand the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. Got to invest time in that study. We need to turn our desire to that study. Without desire for the word, it will never take root in your life. You can sit down, and I know people that do this. Every day they open their Bible and they read. And I'll bet you 15 minutes after they're done reading, they don't know what they read. Many of them. Because they're doing it out of habit and ritual. Habits and rituals are good. If you've got your heart into it, there's got to be desire that goes along with it. To desire the Word. When I open the Word of God, I, ne I, ne I almost never have a goal anymore how far I'm going to read. Some people want to read three chapters, I'm going to read five chapters, I'm going to read this book, whatever. It's usually not my goal. I sit down and I read. And I let the Lord speak. And I may get to a verse, and that verse I need to just sit and dwell on for a while. And He feeds me. He feasts me from one verse or one word or one short passage. We need to spend time and desire and make a commitment to study the Word of God. I have to be very honest with you this morning. In many churches that I've been to, I have been embarrassed, 
I don't know if that's the right word. I've been confused. That would work. When I ask a question in a Bible study that's something that should be well known and everybody's got a blank look on their face and nobody has a clue where I'm going and has no answer to it whatsoever. It is an evidence that we're not studying the word like we should. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Diligently present yourself. Study, the King James says, study to show yourself approved unto God. So, back to our points there. Number one, we need to love the Father. Number two, we need to know His Word. Number three, once you know it, you need to believe it. You got to choose to believe it. God has instructions for every part of our lives. And the study of God's word must be accompanied by belief. You know, when I was in college in, in a biology class, the teacher was taught us about evolution. It was a part of the class. He clearly was a believer in evolution. He said so. I had to study about evolution. I had to read the book. I had to learn the facts. Took a test. Passed the test. Did well. But that didn't mean I believed a word that I read or, or anything that I did. I thought it was all, I, I, nonsense is not the word. I believe it's a false theory. It was a great theory the guy came up with. It just happened to be wrong. There are wrong theories that come along all the time in science. But the word of God, as you read it, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to believe it? Belief requires a decision, not a feeling. Well, I'm just not sure how I feel about that. Well, I don't care what you feel about it. You need to choose to believe it. You've got to choose to believe what the Word of God says. You've got to surrender to God's ways. You've got to accept God's wisdom, not your own wisdom. Can I tell you the things of this world are going to go against the things of the Word of God? The world's going to tell you one thing and the Word of God's going to take you in another direction. What are you going to believe? And if we reject God's Word as truth, we're rejecting God Himself. So number three, you've got to choose to believe. Number four, it's where the rubber hits the road. You've got to choose to obey. You've got to live your life based upon the principles of God's Word. Remember, let me back up for just a minute. Remember, we're talking about how do we win the victory over Satan's attacks in our lives as he comes to bring disorder, as he comes to bring confusion into our life. We've got to be close to the Father. We've got to know the Word of God. We've got to believe the Word of God. God, but number four, we've got to obey the Word of God. We've got to obey what God teaches us. Obedience is the evidence of our belief. If we don't believe, we're not going to obey. We have to, number one, have a desire to please God. Do you have a desire in your life to be pleasing to God? Without that desire, obedience is just ritual and ceremony. Think about the Pharisees in Jesus' day. They were very good at keeping the law. I mean, they kept it very, very well. But it was all ritual and ceremony. There was no heart desire in it. They were just using it as a means of power over people around them. You have a desire to be pleasing to God. Loving obedience warms the heart of God. Just like your children, when they obey you out of desire, when they're trying to please you, man, it just makes you feel good. But forced obedience disappoints the heart of God. Think about it. When your child says, well, I don't want to, but if you're going to make me, I'll do it. Huh? Now, I know as parents, we go, that's exactly right. I told you to, and you're going to do it. <laughs> Amen. 
But what's better is when the child says, is that what you want me to do, Daddy? I'll be glad to do that. Let me get on it. I'll do it right now. That, that warms. It's the same way with God. God is our Father. He wants that desire in us to please Him. Number two, there's got to be a commitment in our life to obedience because you don't always feel like obeying. Go ahead and say amen because you know it's true. You don't always feel like obeying. But you have to make that commitment. We talked about the marriage relationship a while ago. We don't always feel. <laughs> I know there are days my wife doesn't like me. She always loves me because she committed to that, but she doesn't always like me. And don't you girls laugh at me because you and your husband are the same way. But you know what? We've made a commitment of love to one another. No matter what. Now stay with me. Obedience requires desire. It desires commitment. And another one of the things you may have never thought of, obedience requires repentance. Because you are going to fail. You're going to make a mistake. Repentance demonstrates our desire to obey. <laughs> Think about that. When we come before God truly broken, I'm not talking about the kind of repentance that is your hands in the cookie jar. Oh, mommy, I didn't mean to put my hand in it. No, 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 no. That, that's, that one don't cut it. It's when you realize you've done wrong and you come before God and you say, Lord, I've, I've blown it. Yeah. It's a demonstration that you really do desire. Repentance demonstrates that we recognize the truth of God's word. We recognize his authority in our life. And we're going to do our best to follow. Okay, I said five words. We've got to love the Father. We've got to know the word. We've got to believe the word. We've got to obey the word. And finally, we have to receive the promises of God. The Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen. Yes, amen means make it so. Let it be. God's promises are yes and amen. They're not, well, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> That's not God's promises. God may said this, maybe, no. It's yes and amen. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'm hoping for it, but I can't touch it yet. It is the evidence, and I'm going to add these words, in our hearts and our minds, it is the evidence of things that we can't quite see yet. We must be willing to receive according to God's timing. You know, God's promises are for our good and not for our harm. God's promises are for our good. If God seems to be withholding his promise for you, perhaps the moment of fulfillment is not yet. Maybe fulfilling that promise to you right now would not be for your good. Let me give you an example. Growth comes through trials. And if you don't believe that, read James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. For testing, for trials pr bring about perseverance in our life. As well, Romans chapter 5, excuse me, verses 3 through 5, talks in the same way. Trials bring about blessings. In the midst of the trial, we wonder, God, where's the blessing? But if we'll hold on, the blessing is coming. We must trust and believe the fulfillment of God's promise will come at the right time. Think about this. You're walking through the store with your child. Walmart, best place to be probably for a kid. 